Hello and welcome to the last session of Ignite Talks. Uh, it's the fifth session. Uh, Ignite Talks are five minute talks, uh, very quick. And after the talks, we'll have like 20, 30 minutes of uh, conversation and questions. So, can we start? Are you ready? So, here we go. Uh, bridging the gap. You've got two mics. You've got two microphones. Oh, thank you. Two microphones. Hello. Hello. Cool. <laughs> hey, we're technology volunteers from the University of Warwick. We um, volunteer our time along with our studies and we try and teach other student volunteers to go into schools to help kids learn how to code. We also do a coder dojo, which you'll hear about later. <laughs> nice. We, we teach Scratch to younger kids, age roughly about 9 to, nine to 11. And we also have a peak award workshop in which they get to use all the sensors. And we also have Arduino for older kids, about 13 to 15, um, where you have a microcontroller, which is the Arduino Uno, and we, we connect up circuits to them, and we control them by TechScript. This is in C++. However, we found that it's quite a big jump to go from scratch and very little fiddly stuff to having to build fiddly circuitry and going to text code. It, it's, just, it's just quite a jump. So we found that there's a technology gap, and to fill that technology gap, we introduced a PicoBoard style shield for the Arduino, which you guys have around you, by the way. Um, you guys can, can, can pass them around and take a look at them. OK, so the main feature of the ExperiSense, so this is called the ExperiSense. One of the main features is its ability to output stuff. So for that, we have two seven-segment displays. We also have a dial which replaces the slider, for example, found on a Pico board as they're cheaper and also take up less space. We, the, so the Arduino has a limited number of analog pins which limit the number of sensors we can actually have on there. So the switches are essentially a hack to get around this and so allow you to switch between different sensors on there. We also contain a button and a light sensor as they're two of the most common things, for example, found on Pico boards and the ones that are the most used. We've created a, an extension in ScratchX for use of this, and these are some of the blocks that go along with that. So, for example, detecting dial and light sensor values, as well as the more Boolean operators to go over those. These are written very similarly to the Pico board blocks, so as this can be used as a Pico board. We also have more custom blocks, such as that allow you to write to the display. So we ha you can either write to each display individually or display a two-digit number on the display. So this is an example of a simple asteroid game that can be made, played just using the board itself. So, for example, they are just using a dial to control the direction of the rocket, and you press a button to move. Um, just like the Pico board, we've we've um, put four resistance inputs on the experience so that we can attach buttons to with uh, crocodile clips. But they were also all these for extra ports also designed so that you can run conductive thread through them so you can design uh, wearable things. And we also have the EXT ports. Uh, as uh, Alex said, you can switch between them with these, between the dial and the light sensor and the XTs to use them as voltage inputs or outputs. Um, and these are the blocks that we use. Uh, just like any other sensor, we have these, uh, these blocks that report the value. But we also have, um, so we have the normal, a normal read, which is 1, one to 100, like the Pico board. And we also have a sensitive read. This is because the Arduino is able to sense more um, subtle changes in, in values. So this reports all of these very slight changes. And we also have, for more scientific purposes, uh, values reported in kilo ohms. And these are, this is one example that we made. This is another more special block, the ultrasound echo time block. Uh, this can be used with, uh, as opposed to the other example, these are all uh, sensors that are attached to the board externally. Um, and this is just a simple side scrolling game that we've made with an ultrasound sensor on the board. 
And these are pressure sensors attached to a glove uh, that simulate playing a piano, but on any surface. And we've used that um, capability of sensing slight changes to modify the, um, the volume that the keys play at. So this is a final example of a sensor you can make. This is just a homemade tilt sensor, and this example is being used to control a maze, as this is an example of something that could be used to, with children in schools, and also teach about conductivity of water. To summarize, we've created the Xperi Sense to combine the strengths of Scratch and Arduino whilst overcoming the limitations of uh, the Pico board's input-only approach and Arduino's fiddly circuitry. So we found that um, the Pico board similarity accounts for a low floor and the increased sensing capabilities at a high ceiling. Uh, based on feedback from the last conference, um, we decided to update our board and remove um, the physical switches and replace them with switches within Scratch that allow us to switch between the different sensors so quickly that it appears they're working in unison. And we used the extra space to add an extra button uh, to allow the Xperi Sense to be used as a controller. Thanks for listening. Here's our Twitter handle and our website. And that's all. <laughs>
AI was actually trying to reach them uh, directly through messages. And then I created a scratch, a scratch account using a picture. Oh, it's a girl. I, I think now everyone knows, pretty much everyone knows who a I, Ada Lovelace is. Um, I just decided to add, add some goggles, give her like a, a steampunk style, just because it's cool. <laughs> so through this Scratch account, actually, she started asking them about help uh, figuring out uh, how this Arduino gear works. So they, uh, she asked her, um, to build a safe box to protect some very important stones that she had sent us against really bad guys. And uh, she sent us a, vo a vocal message, a voice message uh, that actually my coworker recorded for me uh, to take them to the next stage. One week later, the stones disappeared leaving a message and an Arduino with plug component. And they had to solve the last riddle. It was a series of, of, of riddles and I had some uh, papers hidden in the room as well. And they had to find four letters, A, X, E, L, which is actually my name. And they had solved the big mystery. So the benefits that I see in this is that first it's really easy to do. Just be creative and use what you have at your disposal. Um, just uh, be uh, aware of the kids' reactions maybe to adapt your storyline. Uh, it's fun. It's really fun and it creates engagement on both sides because tutor is happier to teach and kids are even more motivated to come each week. Um, actually, they managed to dig Arduino even deeper than I had planned uh, because they were so excited to do all the stuff that she asked us. Um, and the thing is, yeah, it, it worked really well. And uh, in the end, one, one kid just told uh, his friends that, you know, we, we don't care who, who's behind this. This is just awesome. And deeply in, inside, I, I cried. And uh, yeah, so thank you for listening. Thank you very much. So I think it's done. Your turn. Yes. <laughs> Hi everyone, how's it going? Um, my name is Pete, uh, I'm Head of Community for Europe, Middle East and Africa at the Color Dojo Foundation. Um, so I don't know if anyone here has not heard of Color Dojo before, um, so I'm going to kind of just tell you a little bit about it. So Color Dojo is a volunteer-led uh, movement of free coding clubs for kids aged 7 to 17. Um, <coughs> there are, are quite a lot of dojos around the world um, and it's quite informal. So it was originally founded by these two gentlemen here, Bill Leao and James Welton. Uh, it was started by James in Cork when he was 17, uh, back in 2011 on uh, the 23rd of July. So we actually have our sixth birthday coming up um, soon, which is very exciting. Um, but James was the first 17-year-old to actually hack an iPod Nano. And in Ireland, um, where we're all from, um, there was no coding in the curriculum, so he wanted to start a coding club for young people um, to kind of teach them a little bit more about um, programming. Um, and then he met Bill and he helped him kind of do the first public Coder Dojo and it kind of grew from there. Um, so currently the community there is about 1,350 dojos um, in 72 countries around the world and it's still continuing to grow, all led by volunteers. Um, some of you are actually Coder Dojo community members here, I see some familiar faces, so it's all about you guys. So you can correct me as well if I'm wrong and I miss out anything, okay? Um, 
So just to kind of give you an idea of the impact of everybody that runs a dojo, last year we saw 48,000 kids attending dojos uh, throughout the year, 30% of which are girls. So that's a huge thing. We want to you know, push diversity in tech and encourage um, young women to get involved in STEM. Um, and we also saw 330,000 volunteer hours. So. As I said, it's an open source community. Um, it's a very informal educational environment, so the whole idea is that young people can kind of come to a JoJo, it's free to attend, and you know there are different things for them to engage with. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to kind of show as part of an open source community, you know, we have a logo, but everyone's open to create their own logo. I love this one, it's Totoro up here. Um, but yeah, it's very, very creative, and that really kind of shows the open source element of our community. Um, and we also see, like, you know, young people do their own self-directed learning. Um, the guys who are up first um, talking about the board that they created, they actually run their own dojo, um, and they kind of encourage young people to kind of lead their own learning. So, um, as I said, you know, they learn <coughs> coding skills, and then they also do peer-to-peer -peer learning and social skills. So those are also very important. Um, we recently kind of did a, a youth survey to kind of find out, you know, some figures of the impact of Kota Dojo. So the average age is about 11, the average attendees is about 27 kids per dojo, um, and as we said, there was 48,000 in 2016. One thing that we did learn from this is that Kota Dojo loves Scratch. So we asked all the dojos what's the most popular language that you see at your dojo. Um, and as you can see, 90% of dojos use Scratch. Um, obviously, there are different tables where they might be using HTML, Arduino, you guys, um, Raspberry Pi, Python, loads of different things. I even, I run a dojo myself. Um, in a games company, we use Unity and, you know, Unreal Engine. Um, so it's quite, quite interesting to see that. So, <clears throat> I decided to ask some community members that I know why um, they love Scratch uh, and why the do and dojos love Scratch to find out. So I wanted to share this with, with you guys. So um, Isol who is in Mayo in Ireland, which is kind of a rural part of Ireland, and um, she said it's simple. It can be as simple as com and as complicated as you want it to be. Um, even a beginner can follow the colored blocks and simple instructions to create projects, while those with lots of experience can also create really complex projects. Projects. And then there's the addition of adding on tools like making make and everything like that. Peter uh, Richmond in the UK, he says it enables kids to um, express themselves and their ideas, but they also unconsciously absorb computational thinking principles while building their code. And they also develop a visual memory of typical code structures, which they can go on to use then independently in loads of different other languages, which is very, very interesting. Um, and then uh, Gerald from Portugal, he said, for first co uh, contact, it's a perfect tool because programming with blocks is easy to understand the logic and order, and uh, young people can see the results straight away. Um, and then Nikolai in Greece, he also said, getting started is easy, and this is the most important step that you want them to be uh, confident and engaged with to continue with a positive learning experience. So, I guess overall, those you can kind of see that there is like this positive engagement, this ease uh, of accessibility, and how to use it. Um, and I guess. Yes, that's a real reason why Coder Dojo loves Scratch. Um, there was also Belgium sent in this quite interesting thing when I asked them. They were like, okay, well, we've done uh, a mentor meetup and we've done Scratch forever. Um, question mark, how do we prolong Scratch? How do we engage and continue to engage young people? So, um, as you can see here, they talked about, you know, it's going to be start off simple and you can get really, really complex, you know, and um, provide artworks and sprites to kind of give, um, you know, keep young people engaged. As I saw in uh, Scratch Tree, there's some interesting unicorn sprites and everything like that, so that's very exciting. Okay, two minutes, one more. Um, and then you can extend it with toys, um, and then the challenge of the month. So, uh, a really interesting thing with the challenge of the month, and I've seen this work at dojos, is kind of like having a mini game jam or something to aim towards. Um, and we've done this kind of as a global community. There's an event that we run in Ireland, um, and it was started by a dojo in Dublin, um, because they want to acknowledge and reward young people for creating cool things, but also to give them a project to focus on and to work on and to continue engaging in their learning experience and, and, and progress. Um, so last year, this is the coolest projects. It's 
it's an international event. We had like community members from across the world. Um, there were 575 projects from young people uh, across six categories, and 300 of those were Scratch. So that just shows the impact of like Scratch and how important it is to the Colour Dojo community. Um, and I just want to share some real quick projects. There was um, <coughs> Hospital Holly and Henry. So this was a, a Scratch project which t taught young people who are in hospital about you know, being in hospital and how to like, deal with certain problems and issues and different things like that. Um, there was a Superman operation game, there was an animation tool it was used for. So this is Joey, she's an amazing animator. She used uh, Scratch as an animation tool um, to make 20 minute videos of like, this amazing kind of uh, anime style animation. It was amazing. Um, and then Harvey finally Finally, just was really, really interesting. He did. Um, he created his own uh, Blockly kind of interface for creating HTML websites. So if you knew Scratch, you could make your own HTML websites using what he made. Um, so what I want to say is, like, you know, Color Dojo really, really loves Scratch. It really, really kind of impacts uh, young people around the world. So ran over time. So we're going to talk about uh, our experience with our online course and the lessons learned uh, with the customizability and actually sharing this course with over 200 teachers we've done. So um, I'm Dan Garcia, this is Lauren Mock, and part of the team of folks, uh, Michael Ball is here in the front and Brian Harvey is, is with us as well. Um, so we created the BJC course eight years ago. Um, it locally is taught at UC Berkeley. We now have 60% of our students are young women. So we've done really well in terms of engaging the students at Berkeley locally. Um, boop, next one. Um, so BJC is part of the family of AP computer science principles courses. AP is a system where you have a uh, university course taught in high school. The student takes the high school course and then they take an exam at the end of the year and if they do well on the exam they get college credit or placement. So BJC is one of the family of computer science principles courses, a brand new course. It just launched, it just finished, has 50,000 students who got computer science who probably wouldn't have got it normally without that. It's awesome. BJC is supposed to be non-intimidating, supposed to be open to anybody. It's again non-majors, so there's chemistry majors, English majors, people who are scared of computing. This is a course for them in high school. Um, it has really powerful deep CS big ideas. Please come to our BJC workshop later this, uh, actually right after this, uh, in workshop room one I believe. Uh, functional programming, we kind of, B BJ, it uses SNAP, so SNAP is really scheme under the hood, so we teach functional programming, recursion, higher functions, powerful, beautiful ideas, really great examples, a lot of great projects we have. Um, yoink, next slide. So we realized we weren't, we were not being able to reach students who didn't have a teacher, right? We were working with all these high school teachers around the country and we weren't able to reach the students in a remote rural place or a remote urban school um, who had no high school teacher teaching that course. So how do we get to them? Well, we decided to go uh, global by making an online course in edX. So I spent an entire year working with Lauren and Michael and lots of really wonderful people to make this online course. It's available now. It, our third incantation is gonna come up this coming Labor Day. Um, once we have an online course, you have, like, this is an online resource. You could treat it like an ebook. So the idea is you could make it a small private online course. Any teacher, university, high school, can use those resources we've given to edX, videos, exercises, problems, um, auto grading ex exercises, to uh, bring into their local school and decide what, how, to, how to customize it. They could label it as, this is Mr. Smith's course, and we're using resources from Berkeley, but that's okay, and they've, we've blessed it, it's all Creative Commons, it's all available to anybody. So the idea is a small private online course allows anybody, anybody to grab an edX course as, or an, any course from any online provider as a resource locally. So now Lauren's going to talk about customizing this and working with all, she's been the, the lead project manager for this, to work with all the high school teachers to allow them to adapt the project to their needs. Hi everyone, so wanted to show you what our labs look like versus what they look like on um, edX. And so on the left, 
You can go to bjc.edc.org. This is where all of our lab content is. And this is what, uh, on the right, this is what our labs look like in edX. So we've essentially just put them in the edX shell. You can see that there's like a nice interface for how to interact with them. This is what our autograders look like inside edX. Currently, our autograders don't exist on our regular um, website interface. And so our autograders are essentially a little like submodule beneath our labs exercises inside edX. And so you can see that there's like a submit button down here for credit. And it's, it's embedded right into the curriculum. So like there's the challenge, there's the exercise to work on it. You can click the full screen and get full snap and then go back to smaller embedded. It's really, really nice interface. Yeah. So why would anyone want to use the SPOC over you know, going through our regular website? Teachers love the SPOC because they can change due dates and you know, fit it according to their school calendar year. They can use it to track student progress throughout the year in terms of like exercise completion in like, the overall picture sense. Um, it serves as an automatic pacing guide. A lot of beginner teachers love this because as a new teacher, they're trying to get their feet into the water. They don't know where to start. This is like one area that they could um, rely Rely on in terms of like how to carry out their course for the semester for the year. Um, the SPOC serves as a package content solution, so we have more types of content. Uh, I guess exercises, um, readings, lecture videos that our current labs website does not offer. So these are all supplemental exercises that teachers love to have at their fingertips, extra resources for them to use in their classroom setting. Um, it also, um, we also have instant feedback on our programming assignments through the autograder, but not just for the autograder, but also on our um, other um, exercises that we offer that teachers love for like credit assignment. So. <laughs> So we have, um, so there are some pain points using the SPOC. Um, there's like customization issues where teachers can't like actually edit the content once they um, have access to the SPOC. Um, edX treats the SPOC like um, it's still in beta mode, so there are some bugs there. There's a learning curve to use it. It's not like as user friendly for what teachers would like to do. Um, you can't manually assign grades. If someone wants to like, if you want to like add credit for some other assignment, you can't do that in edX. You can only do it for things that we've already pre-designated as credit assigned um, exercises. There's no, you can't like export grades directly into your own school's learning management system. And there's no dashboard for viewing uh, individual student progress within the SPOC itself. So lessons learned from our autograder integration. We knew it was kind of important to try to get teacher buy-in to using this SPOC and so, um, and our autograded exercises within the SPOC, so we introduced this in our professional development workshops. Um, we needed to explain how the autograder works, um, how to read the results, you know, like what should be expected for the feedback that's given, how teachers should interact with it. A lot of teachers use or think the autograder is like the single source of truth for solutions, but we know that's not true because there are lots of different um, answers that are deemed correct that the autograder might not accept for credit. Um, our feedback needs to be written in a more friendly way so that um, teachers and students can understand what they're you know, looking for and then um, if you use the autograder for like a credit seeking type activity, it restricts creativity because you're building exercises to fit the test cases that the autograder is looking for. And so like any like other solutions that may not work don't receive credit. And so last but not least, edX is great to use for beginning teachers. Um, this is a great resource for them because it has everything that they want. If they want to have more like sophisticated customization, they might not use the um, edX interface itself. And as you've seen in previous sessions, we're looking at integrating the autograder into our regular um, edX lab, or regular labs website so that if teachers want to use the autograder, they don't have to use the edX shell. Um, if you're interested in using the edX or Spock, feel free to email us, email us at contact at bjc.berkeley.edu. Thank you. Okay, the present. Can you just put it on pause for a second? I was. I um. I, when I send in my proposal for this talk, I 
uh, proposed to talk about teaching scratch, uh, no, teaching children about the Romans, the, the Romans in Netherlands through scratch. And I was supposed to tell you about this project and just start that videos, okay. And I was supposed to tell you about this book. But this is a project I did in January, and um, now it's already um, July. And um, in, uh, if you work with children and with computers, you know that uh, changes go very fast. The developments in computers go really fast, and every month, every few months, there are some new things, and you always have to adapt to whatever is new. So by the time you finish your beautiful lesson, um, there's already something new again. So if you're interested in learning about how to introduce the Roman times to children through Scratch, you can talk about this during the lunchtime. Um, this is a lesson I did uh, um, in July, June, July. Actually, this was two weeks ago, the last lesson. And um, there's something you might not notice, but on every uh, photo that passed so far, there is a, a fidget spinner in the screen, somewhere in the screen. Maybe you didn't notice it yet. And um, um, I came into a cl I do after school activities, so I came into the classroom and the teacher was there still with their with his class, and he wanted to help me. And he told the kids, "Look, if you want to learn something, please put your spinners away and concentrate on the next class." So the teacher went and I said, okay, who has a fidget spinner? Please put it on the table. <laughs> and um, we, what else can you do when you have 12 kids and, and then seven or eight of them are spinning their spinners the whole lesson? So what else can you do but do a lesson about fidget spinners? So first thing, can you draw a fidget spinner? Well, first we just put them all together. Can you put them in such a way on the table that when the first one starts rotating, the others are also rotating. This is very complicated. It's actually not even possible, I think, to connect them all together in such a way that they all start rotating each other. The next exercise was to draw one. Can you draw a fidget spinner in scratch? It's not so easy. You should use vector drawing. It makes it more easy, but this is hard for the children. Um, so some kids spent the whole lesson designing their spinner. Uh, next question, can you make it rotate? This is also not so hard. You use the repeat forever loop and then you insert the ro um, rotate 15 degrees and it spins. But when you spin a real spinner, it slows down. It doesn't spin forever, it slows down. Um, this is the part where they start designing their spinners. It's a very nice thing to do. Um, making, making it slow down is actually already the challenge for the ones who are more in advanced. Uh, some kids will spend the whole hour designing their spinners. You just need a variable, uh, how many degrees it's spinning, and then make it degrees until it reaches zero, and then it stops. Okay, when you make that, you program it, and then, hey, when it stops, it starts spinning again the other direction and it gets faster. So you need a condition, conditional. If speed is smaller than zero, it should stop. So by kids bringing in their fidget spinners, they learn everything about programming. Uh, one very important part in my lessons is always to present your work. I spend a lot of time that they present their work and present, tell each other what they made and explain to each other what they made. I think this is the most important part of the lesson. And this question here was, can you make your real spinner spin at the same speed as the one that you made on the screen? So it's a lot of fun and also makes them active, not just sit behind the computer, but actually do something, move. And uh, we were all really surprised about what came out. And if they start spinning on the screen and you take photos, it actually becomes like a real artwork. So next time you have 10 kids entering your classroom and they're all spinning and you get a little nervous about it, think of something what you can do with it instead of asking them to concentrate on your lesson. But sorry for you, spinners are already over and the next hype will come, so you'll have to invent something new for the next thing to come. I 
have more slides than I thought. Last one. Should be this one, yes. We've got one last speaker um, that you just met one hour ago. He is not here, but he just recorded um, a video for the Ignite talk. It's a seven minutes video, it's not a five minutes video, but it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> And if, you, if you've got questions for Samson, he asked me to tell you that you can write him questions uh, on Twitter and he will answer you. Um, here, no, 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 here.
So, uh, no, 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 I don't know. Uh, not now. <laughs> so, please, all the speakers can join me at the stage, and we'll start. Um, uh, some, we have some time for questions and for debate. We had some interesting debates in previous sessions. Maybe today we have a great, great debate. So, one mic is for you, and. Uh, Another one for the audience, and we've got the first question. Good. Uh, yes. Get it going quickly. Okay, my question would be for Simone. For me. Uh, oh. This is on. Yes, it's on. Yes, mine is also on. Good. Uh, I, my company is operating. It seems similar to yours, with going into schools and doing after-school uh -huh. classes in a non-school way. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you have any? Uh, tips for dealing with teachers who um, are not convinced by our methodology. Um, I'm sorry. So, oh, do you have any tips for dealing with teachers yes. who um, do not believe in what we do by teaching through this different method? This is, oh yeah, I, I've run into many, many teachers who don't really get it. I've, sometimes you work together with a teacher, and I had one teacher, and the kids were creating stories in Scratch, and the goal was to introduce them to programming. And the teacher was all the time correcting their spelling and changing all the small letters into the capital letters. And she was very strict on, on correcting the capitals. And my, my first tip is to have a um, to speak with the teacher before the lesson and explain them that for once it's not important if there are spelling mistakes. Let them make mistakes in typing, but focus on the story they are making. But it's very important to tell to, to talk with them before and explain what is your um, goal of the lesson. And you want them to express themselves, to be creative, to explore, to play, to enjoy. And for once, let's forget about the. the um, things that they do all day in school. <laughs> so maybe that helps. Uh, yeah. yeah. Then I have a question, I think, for you. Um. I have a question for the joy and beauty of computing people. I was wondering if you made any additional material specifically for teachers to help them run the course in their own schools. We did an online course in Scratch as well on the EDX platform, and we overestimated how easy it was for teachers to use the course in the classroom because they asked us, we don't have the knowledge of things in the course, but not about only about programming, but also about practical things. How do you use a teacher account in Scratch and all these type of things? Did you make extra stuff for that? Um, we're actually very fortunate to be partnered with a group called EDC, and EDC has created a really, really extensive teacher's manual that describes everything about here's what the course is about, here's how to run discussions. The course isn't just programming, so there are times when Many teachers who have no experience with running discussions, a conversation with, with everyone. We have computing in the news every day where we look into the news and we say, what's some computing that's in the news and let's talk about it together. And they don't know how to run that. So we kind of give advice how to do the meta things like that. So it's really great. Plus we have webinars once a month-ish where we talk to teachers and answer their questions. And we have an online, uh, Lauren is part of the online community on Piazza, which is a big forum we use. And we have almost 700 teachers who are answering each other's questions. So there's support all around, but really the Teacher's guide is really the key thing to that. Thank you. Yes, uh, for Pito Shi, um, I noticed on the map of Code Dojo in the world that there is not so much activity going on in Africa. And I was wondering why is that? Because, as I assume, EMEA includes Africa. And what I saw this morning during the keynote, there must be something going on right now. So yeah. I was wondering. What what stops them from making other dojos? Yeah, so that's actually a really, really good question because uh, it's a region I'm really, really passionate about. So just to kind of give you, and I actually, I, I'm going to reach out to the Africa Code Week and all the members here, which is great. And I've already had one or two discussions. And if there's any more in the room, I'd love to talk to you. Um, so just to kind of give you an idea, there are 30 dojos in 13 African countries um, to date. Um, 10 new ones have been started this year, which is great. Um, a huge thing and barrier that we see. Um, so it's very, very different to, I guess, our experiences on the continent and different things like that. Electricity, 
like never mind Wi-Fi, never mind like hardware is then also another step. So um, educators and obviously there is a movement and there are people that are interested in spreading like if it's not only Scratch but like HTML or whatever languages. And um, there is still that barrier. So it's really really resource based, um, and that is the barrier. Uh, there is no shortage of people that are wanting to get involved and wanting to start something. And there is a movement, absolutely, but it's it's resource um, and that's one thing personally that I've been trying to work on is engaging different organizations where whether it's like the US State Department to cover and support like Africa Coder Dojo where we have a program that we're trying to support uh, dojos in the region with hardware and different things like that um, but yeah definitely it's resource based um, I have two questions. Um, the first question, your autocoder in Snap, is that a bit like do uh, the Dr. Scratch tool for Scratch, or, or did I misunderstand that? Um, so that's the first question. Um, I, I don't know what Dr. Scratch is, um, but s so Snap is just, we borrowed the source code from original Scratch 1.4, we made some modifications, and then we rewrote it in, in uh, HTML5. So it's basically, it's a, it's an ex in some sense, it's, it's a parallel initiative to Scratch so with other features. So Dr. Scratch, basically you feed in a URL for a Scratch program and it'll give you some diagnostics that will allow you to help ah, you assess it. So oh, it'll see. say, oh, it's I got see. this many aspects of this. And it's just a way of sort of evaluating. Oh, that's really nice. No, I've seen some work. There was also a, a, an Ignite talk on on that the initial, the first session. Um, this is less of a tell you the health of your uh, program, uh, more of here's a challenge, did you do the challenge? We want okay. you to draw a square and then we poke into your code and say, did you add a repeat loop and did you do a, a move and a turn? Uh, or if it's an IO, like a reporter block, in Snap you can make reporter blocks, you can't do that in Scratch. So if it's a reporter block, it's like, can you, here's the test cases and do you match all the test cases? Kind of standard auto grading things. Okay. Thank you. And then the second question was around, you mentioned the 40%, which we've all heard about, which is fantastic. So I suppose, are there any, have you done any research around which particular aspects of the course are helping that, or is it just the whole course in general? Thank you. Uh, that's a great question, and uh, I, I've actually gone around the, the, the United States talking about this a little bit, um, and one of the things we found, and most people would probably agree with this, it's the chance when you give a student the chance to create their own project. That's just, that's, that's, that's the, but it's not what's happening in universities. Most universities universities say go to project one, go to project two, go to project three, do the final project, and all of them are told to you by the teacher. So what's really powerful about this computer science principles course is all the flavors of them have to do this create task, and create task, you have to let the, choo the student choose what they want to do. And so that's, whenever we have students who say this is so engaging to me, it's when they do the demo. I think I saw the demos people did at the end of the day. I love that when you had the people do the spinners and stuff, and you, you have to not only let them choose the project they want to do, but also to let them show it off at the end of the year and just that's they're so proud and if you're in high school what you do is you have an auditorium filled with other students who don't know about the course and the students get a chance to be on stage to show off their work the, no one is more proud than when the moment with a student who worked really hard on their own project that they cared about gets chosen as one of the and you let, you let the class choose the best five or something because you probably may, may not have the time to show everyone and you show the best ones and the, and hopefully you have a really nice dis diversity of students showing off the work and they're so proud and the parents are filming and it's like such an amazing day. So letting them choose their own projects is fundamentally the thing that really works in our class that we've seen work in other aspects as well. All right, my question's actually for Axel. Um, I, I wanted to know how long you've been working with uh, Magic Makers. Or uh, it's been one, one year. One year? Yeah. Have you had anyone, uh, well, I assume you have, but um, do you have uh, any of the kids come back to you um, saying like can we do this again or do you have any excitement to uh, have additional like Actually, projects uh, sorry uh, again like uh, additional sessions of projects like the the entire mystery uh, presentation you gave like um, do you have anyone who comes back and says I'd like to do another thing like this yeah I, I actually the thing is um, I did it for the second trimester 
And for the third trimester, I decided not to do this. And they were actually kind of disappointed at the start. And the, um, it's, it, it became a thing that they, they would remind me of AL uh, yeah, several times during the year. And oh, yeah, yeah, we, we, like AL did. And it was like, yeah, the, the character um, existed. Uh, and, and the thing is, uh, yeah, I, well, I, I could tell that they, they enjoyed it, and, 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 um, but yeah, I just didn't find an interesting way to, to, to do it again. But uh, I think that if uh, I had the, the same group uh, the following year, I would be more than happy to do it. And, but I would find another way to do it. You know, I, I just wouldn't do it exactly the same. You know, I, I would have to change the way I would do it in order to, again, surprise them, you know? This is what it's all about, you know? Running time. Uh, yeah, I had a second question, but I'd like to give everyone a chance. Uh, for the Warwick team? Um, so, when you guys started building the Xperi Sense, I mean, we, we see that you've designed it in a way that's very child friendly. Everything is very big, everything is clippable. Um, what was the, the starting point? What was the inspiration? Did you see another product that you said, we want this but that? Um, and, and what was the discussion behind, just a quick description of what was the process of cutting out features and adding features? like? Uh, who who was the butcher in this case? And <laughs> um, so it was very 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 heavily inspired by the Pico board, yeah. um, because we did an awful lot of work with the Pico board. So the only thing that's gone from the Pico board is the microphone, um, and in some part that's because we can't really get it on the board, and there aren't enough pins. And the other reason was because we personally didn't use it so much. Um, and the things that it can do that we added extra are designed in such a way that it lets you do you know, common introductory Arduino things, so you can do things like blinking LEDs. Um, and also, we at the time had a team of science students, and we wanted to do lots of STEM-based activities as outreach, and um, having accurate resistance reading and accurate voltage readings let us do that. And that was quite important to us at the time. Oh, okay, so it was more about changing the platform yeah. than changing the functionality. And the other thing was, is it available? Where where can we get it? Ah, um, or, or can we make it ourselves? Uh, the the idea is absolutely to um, to open source the hardware is something that we very sort of have aspirations to do. Um, we have limited funding. The the ones we've managed to make have been heavily sort of supported by the university. Um, we're working really, really hard to try and get them available to people, hopefully approaching cost price if we can, because we're quite conscious that buying class sets of things gets prohibitively expensive very quickly. More questions? No, um, I have two comments. Uh, the first one is for you and Margaret. I mean, it's, this is my sixth Scratch conference, and every single year you're bringing here new students, new volunteers, some are repeating, and they're, they're doing amazing job to explore um, the world of sensing, sensing the world. So thank you very much, because it's so inspiring for, for us, your job. And one other comment is uh, about, you said something that made me think, because you said, we go to schools and do non-school-like activities or non-school, in the non-school-like style. And I'm a teacher. I, I, <laughs> I work in a school, so, um, and I think school is changing a lot. And conferences like that are helping us to change how school works. And thank you very much. <laughs> Max, thank you for your amazing presentations. Um,